This is the Coffee with the Geek Show. It is May of 2023. The year is, of course, flying by fast in the school year anyways. My name is Andy Wheelock. This show is the Coffee with the Geek Show, and it's all about talking with educators about technology or ed- education best practices. Let's not even go ed tech over a good cup of coffee or beverage of your choice. Today's guests are going to be a tag team. This is going to be a little different than my usual one-person interview, so this is going to be fun. And we've got two great educators that have started their own podcast, which is what I really want to dig into, and also I want to highly recommend it. It, I was on it last week and uh, really had a great time. It's called The Toasted, or just Toasted Podcast, and there's a blog as well. Its Its focus has a seeing failure as a soup power. Love that. It's a powerful theme, I think, that uh, latches on to educators in general. So a little bit about my guest, uh, Margie Wright, is a Rochester, New York native who subscribes to astrology as a science. Boy, we could talk about that as just one one episode. Definitely. <laughs> uh, Nick would not like that, but yes. Oh, yeah, I was just... <laughs> This is where I mute. <laughs> <laughs> she loves a great story. She's a creative soul. I like that. Um, she's a proud mom and diehard Buffalo Bills fan. It's kind of hard not to be a Bills fan if you're in Buffalo, Rochester area. It's agreed. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of a cult, <laughs> but sacrilege if not. <laughs> yeah. And also joining me and her co-host in the Toasted podcast is. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention you are a 29 year public in this is year 29 in public 29. education. Yeah. You, you and me, oh, buddy, crazy, 29. Right. Uh, and currently a district level administrator in Western New York. Uh, Nick Farnoli is a resident. This is her co host of Naples, New York. Nick is a professor of English at a local college. He's also a musician. Boy, we could dig into that one. Uh, an educational consultant, an education consultant. And this is probably one where he spends a lot of his time is a father of three wonderful boys. Busy, busy. <laughs> Lots of energy there. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to both of you. I'm really glad that you uh, are joining me. And again, I was so honored to be a part of your podcast. It was really fun. Oh, we're glad and, to have you. Yeah. Really exciting. <laughs> For sure, so yeah. we'll we'll start with an easy question. I hope is are you a coffee drinker and what's your favorite blend? Who's going first? You're on it, right? <laughs> I'm like I will. Um, yes, I am absolutely a coffee drinker. Um, I like a dark roast. I drink my coffee black, so it has to be a good quality dark roast. Um, some of my favorites, one of my ones I love um, is the Pete's, P-E-E-T, Pete's Coffee, the Major mm. Dickinson blend or Dickinson blend. Um, that's delicious because um, it's dark without being like heavy and oily. I also, of course, love Starbucks, um, Italian roast or Verona. Um, you know, in the wintertime, that Sumatra is nice and, and, uh, and heavy. So those are, those are my favorites. Nice. I hadn't heard of that one. How about you, Nick? Oh, man, I'm a, <clears throat> I have a real problem. <laughs> I without <clears throat> exaggeration I probably drink 10 cups a day um which is not healthy I recognize but so it's it's my main <laughs> beverage actually um and I generally drink my coffee black as well I my favorite is leftist coffee by um uh gimme coffee out of Ithaca that's mm. my favorite blend um, and I really do enjoy that. Although if, if we're being completely honest, I'm not all that picky about coffee. Uh, I kind of <laughs> like, like three day old gas station coffee, just as well as I like <laughs> any other coffee. And I think I, I blame a lot of that on teaching, to be honest. <laughs> Probably. It's yeah. always really bad coffee in schools or for a long oh, time. Yeah. It was, but... Oh yeah. If you get those <laughs> institutional, you know, old metal ones, those, those, yeah. are, those are rough, but they've come a long way. Come a long yeah. way. But coffee's doing a little bit of a renaissance now, too. I was just talking with a colleague about that. You know, you get like single, uh, well, in wine, we would call it single vineyard, but I guess in, what do they call it in, in the coffee world? Single, single bean. 
single, single rose, bean, single bean. Single yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you see a lot of that now. Yeah, and you you brought up the name Ithaca. I'm an Ithaca college grad, so I spent many oh. a, many a day there. Beautiful little city. Very and, cool. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. What's yeah. what's your coffee? What's your poison there, uh, Andy? I'm pretty much a <laughs> standard. Um, yeah, I don't have any a lot of fancy outside of just a Tim Hortons good old medium roast with cream. Yeah. <laughs> Straight down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Can't Nothing go wrong, wrong with Tim Hortons. Dark roast as well. Dark roast is usually yeah. adds a little the, extra. The punch. Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons dark roast is pretty darn good. It is absolutely. All right, so let's uh, dig into some educational topics here. So yeah. first of all, I, I'm always fascinated by uh, how you you got to where you are in education. So could you just tell me a little bit about your educational journey? We talked a little bit about your background, but maybe uh, you know, yeah. Let's just dig into that question. Sure. So um, I always, I loved school as a kid. I loved going to school and being in school and things like that. And, um, you know, when you get ready to graduate, everybody's like, oh, you know, you're going to be a teacher, you should be a teacher. And that really was not what I wanted to do. And so I, I pushed back in probably the most obedient, um, non-rebellious, rebellious kind of way of being like, no, I'm going to do this. And I really was fascinated by law and, and people and people's stories. And I really liked that. And I really thought about, um, I loved writing. So I really thought about doing something in, in that discipline. And, um, but my, I had a lot of, family pressure to go into education and not that you know, I only had one, um, my one aunt was an educator, but she wasn't the one pressuring me. So I ended up going um, to my beloved Cuca College uh, in the Finger Lakes on Cuca Lake. Mm-hmm. I love my alma mater, Cuca, and um, started out to be a teacher. And at Cuca, you have to do what's called a field period, which is um, it w- at the time, I mean, I, this is fall of 87, you know, to have a six week internship in your intended field that is, you must complete three credit course um, in between the fall and spring semester was paramount. It got you into the classroom. And now, I mean, kids who are education majors are in the classroom right away. Back then it wasn't until student teaching. And so I went with my second grade teacher and I was like, um, okay, yep, I, I love kids. I mean, I always babysat and I volunteered and things like that, but I'm just like, this is boring. Like, this is the last thing I want to do for the rest of my life. So I changed my major and I graduated with political science and history and um, did a short stint as a television news producer at Channel 13 um, in Rochester. And then just life circumstances by then I had met who would, um, you know, I would end up marrying and, um, and he was in law enforcement and it, I moved downstate an hour outside New York City, and there's really no market there unless you're going to go into New York City for broadcasting. So I thought, you know what, I really want to have a family. I want to have kids. I I have all these credits. All I need is three classes in in my undergrad. So I took those and got my master's in education and never looked back. Um, I started out teaching downstate. Um, I had my loved it because my classroom was like the United Nations, and (laughs) I really fell in love with that. Um, I fell in love with the you know, my master's focused on um, this breaking the school to prison pipeline, poverty, um, you know, generational poverty, things like that. And I really, that's alternative education. That's really what I love to do. And so um, I just kind of threw myself into it. I did special ed, general ed, and elementary for a number of years. I did high school special ed. um, And then I went into administration. So we moved to Canandaigua in 2005. And um, I had been tapped on the shoulder numerous times to go into administration. But with my kids being young, I really just didn't want to lose that time with them. So um, once my son was a junior in high school, my daughter was a freshman in high school, I was like, you know, this is the right time. And then within two years, I was an assistant principal, then eventually a principal, director of special ed, and now I'm chief officer for curriculum and human resources. And um, yeah, so it was an unusual path, but I, I would ha- not have it any other way. I think having that outside perspective is, is a good thing. Yeah, that's why I love to ask this question, because I think the journey is usually not a straight line from mm-hmm. high school to teacher. <laughs> but... No, no, I, I don't tend to do straight lines, <laughs> even if I want them in my life and want the structure. I, I just, you know, it's I, I'm definitely over the river, through the woods, <laughs> curve, double back, you know, all that kind of stuff. Nick, how about you? So my yeah, like Margie, I would say mine is not a straight path. Uh in particular, uh, probably because I refused to ever be a teacher. <laughs> I didn't want to be a teacher. And, um, and I, I've told this story a couple of times, but 
when I was in high school, I was pretty good at math. <clears throat> Love math, actually, and and science. And so if you're good at math and science and you're male in you know, the early 90s, mid 90s, <clears throat> pretty much they said you should be an engineer, which I was really excited about because I thought they meant that I was going to drive a train. And so <laughs> I ended up uh, applying to engineering schools. Uh, I got a full ride to RIT. And when I realized what the job would mean and what I would be doing in college, I was like, oh, no, that's not for me. So my mother uh, sort of famously was like, well, you can she'll deny this, but it's true. Um, <laughs> so she she said, you can you can move out you know, kind of find your way and, um, or, or, you know, go to college. And so I moved out and, um, and it was great. I moved in with a band and we played music all the time. We had fun somewhere along the line. I realized I wanted to go back to school and I took, um, I was taking music classes cause I thought I was going to be a musician, full-time musician. Um, but it turns out that I like to eat too much. So I, uh, I took a class at, Finger Lakes Community College um, with a professor who is now my colleague. It's kind of funny. Um, and it was great. I loved the class. It was an English 102, you know, introduction to literature class, but it was just a really great class. And the book, the book that sort of inspired my shift was um, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which had just had just been released and now it's a classic, but I read that book and I was like, man, I want to do that. I want to do that for a living. Um, the problem was I wasn't a particularly good writer and I didn't, um, I had never previously seen the value in writing, but I ended up going to school and getting a, a degree in English. And, um, and then when I got out, I, and I was going to be a professor, I refused. I was not going to be a high school teacher. There's no way I was doing that. I was going to be a professor. And so, but I had a, I had my son, um, I was a little older in college anyway, but I had had my first son when I was like 26 or, or something like that. So I was just finishing up my <clears throat> bachelor's degree and I got out and I had a couple of offers. In fact, I had an offer from Cornell to go um, for my, my PhD, but it wasn't fully funded and it seemed really irresponsible and there really weren't a lot of professor jobs. So my friend who was teaching high school was like, you should consider it, you know, get your certification. So I like stamped my feet, you know, to St. John Fisher college feeling somewhat of a failure. Cause I, like I had never wanted to be a teacher. And, um, and then I got into the classroom and I loved it actually. Um, and I wouldn't have left except that like Margie, I kind of got, you know, tapped a little bit to go into administration and, and a little bit too, it was financially driven um, where, you know, I was a single, single income household and <clears throat> I was working like four jobs. And eventually I was like, I should just be an administrator. I'd make more money and work less. And which was true. So I did. Um, and I did that for a few years. And then through COVID kind of felt like, you know, this isn't exactly the path that I wanted to go on. And um, with a few other steps in there, I ended up at, uh, teaching at college level. It just took me a lot longer than I thought it would take me. So now I do this and, uh, I keep my foot in K-12 by helping out other districts with a bunch of different things. Great. All right. So <coughs> you mentioned, uh, Nick about being inspired by a book with their other inspirations for both of you that, that came across the way that, that led you to where you are. Go ahead, Nick, since you expound on your book thing. Um, I think there were a couple, I think that, you know, I talked about this one professor at, um, pretty sure I can name him, right. There's no reason I can't name him. Yeah. So, um, John Paulzer, who, a uh, wonderful professor here at Finger Lakes Community College, I would say was a major influence in terms of shifting my focus from music to English. Um, and he's just a terrific, terrific colleague, terrific, um, you know, teacher. So that is one inspiration. Um, although am I supposed to pick inanimate objects here? 
No, no. Okay. It could be a person or, you know, yeah. an event yeah. or something. Or the other, you know. the other one, which caught me off guard was I, when I went to um, uh, St. John Fisher, I worked with Dr. Russell Coward, who um, was my English methods teacher. And I remember being in one of my field placements and I came back and I was like, boy, I don't know. I don't think I'm cut out to be a teacher. And he was like, well, tell me why. And I was like, I just was really bored by my field placement because I'm like handing out dittos and I'm doing all this stuff. And he starts laughing. He, he goes, what do you think teaching is? And I was like, well, I mean, that's kind of what I experienced as a student. And that's a lot of like what I just saw in my first placement. He goes, so remember that and then don't ever do it. And I was like, oh, right. You can do this differently. So he kind of turned me on to two books that I would recommend. The first was um, Teaching as a Subversive Activity by Neil Postman. Uh, mm. It's an old book and scary that it was, I think it was written in 1969, maybe, might be seven. Um, and I re- reread it recently and it's still just as relevant today as it was wow. in 1969. And, uh, and shockingly so about, you know, the sort of need to rethink education and educational reform. And the other one that I stumbled across um, through uh, Dr. Coward was um, Prairie's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I think really breaking down systems of oppression that are extremely well, you know, designed, frankly. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite quotes that I heard recently was there's nothing wrong with the educational system. It does exactly what it's designed to do, Mm. which I found interesting in light of, you know, if you're a a critical theorist and, you know, if you've read Paulo Freire's work, that's sort of his, his working thesis. Mm -hmm. Well, we could dig into that deeply as well. Margie, do you want to talk a little bit about your? Um, sure. Um, like I said, I love inspirations being in school. Um, I had, you know, my, my own home life as a child was very chaotic and, and um, not the most stable. So school was my solace. School was my place. Um, I, I loved, I was a very precocious child. So I was always like questioning and wondering and how come and all of this. And um I, you know, you don't know it as a kid, but I I apparently was good at, at quote unquote, doing school. I was an obedient kid. Mm -hmm. I knew what to do, you know, type deal. Um, I was, I'm very grateful that I, you know, reading came super easy to me. And so because of that, like you could just turn in the perfunctory work and I got to do all this extra stuff. Um, I mean, even in, in sixth grade, I, I just would go in the morning and get my assignments from my teacher and I would go down and help move and set up this whole new library edition and, and the librarian would be like, Hey, would you read these books and write a review for me? Like that was like, you know, and I'd help with classes and I did, you know, do my work sometimes during the day or at night and turn it back in the next day in sixth grade and get it back. I didn't like go to any sixth grade classes. Like, you know, you couldn't do that in school today, but I had a grand old time. Um, you know, and so I loved school, but in particular, my fourth grade teacher, um, Mrs. Franks, she was from England. So having a teacher with an accent was just so cool. And I happened to be that year in, um, the actual uh, fourth grade was a gifted and talented program. And I, I don't say that because of anything other than it was so exciting to do school differently. And that is what fired me to make that the opportunity for all students in school, particularly students who are never given those opportunities because they don't test at the highest level or they may not have the highest reading level or something like that. But it doesn't mean they don't, they can't think big thoughts. And um, so Mrs. Franks, we just did everything differently. And it was so exciting to me. I remember one of the things that she did was we all had a number, like we didn't go by our name, we used our number. And I was number 13. And so people who were in that class, we all still remember like what number everybody was and things (laughs) like that, which is pretty funny. Um, So 
for me in education as a teacher, I wanted to be able to take it and make it so that it was like that for students, that it was something different. You're still hitting the standards in education. You're still learning, but doesn't mean you have to turn to page 31, read this, answer questions one through five. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but not when that's everything in every subject. So I really wanted kids to think differently. Um, what I loved is that, you know, I didn't understand pedagogy, obviously as a fourth grader, but sitting there in her classroom and she would pose a question to us or it might be a statement and say prove this wrong and you're like huh you know and you had to like just think differently and do things differently and we were um, given a lot of self-directed learning which I didn't realize at the time I just thought I just knew it was exciting to go there I wanted to be there every single day and I didn't understand that I was learning um, and then you know one of the things we did do is a lot of reading um, as a as a kid a books that I would get out over and over again were Bridge <clears throat> Terabithia, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, and All of a Kind Family. And um, the All of a Kind Family was about a bunch of sisters, and they were in turn of the century New York City. They were a Jewish family. So I always loved learning about cultures. I loved learning about the history of people, just like with The Witch of Blackbird Pond. The main character grows up in Barbados, so you hear about that, then into this Puritan society, so you hear about that. And then she befriends this person who's, you know, deemed to be a witch, but she's really an herbalist and naturalist. And so I've always loved anything that, like, allowed me to have conversations either via characters in a book or with somebody else just to so that study of people um social studies it just made sense that that was my favorite thing to teach i know you and i have had some fun conversations mm -hmm. about that and i really loved getting students excited about that about seeing history more as a story of people in a time period um that you know that their lives were structured by either the state of technology at the time, what was happening on the world stage at the time, the political people in charge at the time, or the values and beliefs at the time. And now if you took those same people and put them to this era, what do you think would happen? You know, and so it's just, mm -hmm. uh, I've always loved doing the, those sorts of things. You know, some of the grown up books, um, Brene Brown's Dare to Lead, I think is a phenomenal book. Um, it's, it's definitely one I think that helped me change how to do leadership uh, as far as um, having some of those difficult conversations with people that to try and get people to have more of a stamina and a tolerance for it's okay to talk through an issue like it, it's okay to do that you know and and that's what I think is some of the hardest parts about having um, in school leadership is being able to have some of those conversations sometimes just by virtue of the structure of the hierarchy um, other times because of tenure other times because of fear you know so I think that trying to School culture makes it very difficult, I think, to be able to um, get around the table in the same way. So I, I've always thought like doing a book study together is one way to have that, you know, come together on a certain topic and then take that and make that something that you all do together, sort of all those oars rowing in the same direction. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like filled up already. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you get Nick and Margie. It's like, you know, uh, yeah. we're a lot. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need two cups of coffee for this one. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So let's talk about the Toasted uh, blog and podcast. I sure. was telling Nick earlier, I love the idea that that you both are doing this, that you're, that you're content creators. And, you know, I was... I've been thinking a lot about we need, this is the next step I think in schools is, is every teacher should be a content creator and they mm -hmm. should be encouraging their kids to be content creators because the world, I mean, let's face it, the kids already are content creators, right? Yeah. But they're yeah. using TikTok and they're using uh, Instagram and they're using Snapchat. Let's, why aren't we harnessing that, you know, um, and using it for, for that, but, let's put that aside and talk about just talk about the podcast and how it came about. Um, what, what advice can you give to others, teachers and admins that want to dip their toes into something like this? Uh, go ahead and dig in. I'll let you we'll take a turn. You want to go ahead, Nick? Well, I think actually it's interesting that you say that because some of the motivations for the podcast are also the motivation or the reason why I think people shy away from content creation. So hmm. in the sense that we both have experienced 
personal and professional failures Mm -hmm. and um, through our friendship and through, you know, our professional friendship, but also our, our personal friendship had a lot of conversations around what that meant and how that felt and how you cope with that. And one of the things that, you know, became helpful was understanding that <clears throat> there are other people who, you know, while no one can ever really understand your life or what you've been through, there are people who have been through significant things that, and, and the conversation, the open and frank conversation about, you know, <clears throat> the rawness of all the emotions that failure can bring was really helpful. And so we started talking about like, well, what could we do? How do we, how do we open this conversation in a way, um, you know, that makes sense? And um, and Margie, I'll I'll say this, and then you can kind of jump in. But one of the things I don't have is fear of like trying something new, right? I've always been pretty um, pretty gung ho on trying something new, and so even though I'd never created a podcast, I was like, Margie, we should do this podcast. <laughs> and um basically bullied margie into to doing it like she was she was fairly willing to do it but wanted to spend more time thinking about it um and and planning it than i did so um so we just kind of jumped in but i think i think you know yeah, the connection it, so but what what nick means by we just kind of jumped in was we did a practice recording <laughs> and and by jumping in, it was a practice recording that he deemed to be fit for air, and that became episode one. And I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> you know. So Nick does all the um, you know, he handles all the recording stuff as far as you know the editing and all of that jazz. So he has the power of the controls that way. Okay, um, I will we- say that was a little bit of a communication faux pas on my fa- on my part. <laughs> like I thought, I think I said. Like, practice has a, a different synonym is this what we're gonna now, <laughs> do you remember we had this discussion where we recorded it and i thought you gave me the go-ahead i didn't no does not no that was episode that, no that was a, that, that was, was another a blog. episode that was oh. a blog oh yeah, that's that was, right that was the blog that i sent you know yes yeah. when you send the email that says oh yeah your eyes only and he's like i love it i posted it i'm like what part of fear i like oh i didn't read the email i'm like oh. i didn't yeah i didn't catch that so <laughs> yes yeah, so, Yeah, Nick and I are brother and sister here with us. But so Nick and I met, we were both principals in neighboring districts. And um, with our our third partner in crime there, Chris Saki, um, we, our three districts together, we did a lot. And in all three of us, we were a great team and we became, you know, uh, great friends. And then, you know, when Nick moved on to his stuff and I moved on to my stuff, like we just, you know, all three of us have remained close friends. And during COVID and all that, um, you know, we had talked about bounced around the idea of a podcast here. And it was always like, well, what's it going to be about? What's it going to be about? And then in the course of that time, um, we each were going through some tough stuff in life. Um, For me, you know, I was going through a divorce. Um, There had been a change in leadership in the district I was in, and it was no longer a place I felt I could stay or thrive. And I'd never been faced with something like that before. Um, And it it, as we were talking about the fact that like, you know, that the shame you feel, you just feel like a recluse, like we talked about on one of our podcast episodes, just even like we would, I would avoid going to Wegmans, like the grocery store, you know, you'd go like late at night, I would always go really late at night or really early in the morning, I did not want to face people, I didn't, what do you say, what do you do, and, and so the sense of like wearing a scarlet letter um, around, which is another one of my favorite books, but so Nick had actually said, he goes, you know, it's, he goes, it's a shame because once you have something like this happen, people will reach out and they'll share something with you about some major life, quote unquote, failure. You never knew that about them and you don't see them any differently, but now you have this common bond. And, and Nick had said, he goes, you know, he goes, that's the problem. He goes, there should be community. This should be something we talk about. And I'm like, you're right. It is. And then that's how the podcast was birthed. It was the idea that, wait a second, failure is a part of life. You know, it's not the end. And it, it, and it is where you find your superpower. You know, you, you don't let it define you. You learn the tools of resilience. You learn learn the tools of acceptance, of leaning on each other, of um, accepting help, of giving help later on. Like, because you find that, you know, um, Nick had gone through his divorce before I went through mine. And so he was a source for me there. And then when I had stuff happen with my career, it was before Nick had stuff with him. So, you know, I could be, a, you, you just, 
you find this community that you didn't know existed and we're like, why does this have to be a secret society? Why do you have to feel so alone in this at a time when the last thing you should do is feel alone because you're so hard on yourself as it is. And so um, we were like, well, then let's start telling stories. Let's just, you know, do that. And Nick definitely is much more like, I'll figure it out. We'll do it. Well, whatever. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I'm like, well, hold on, hold on. You know, and then I was much more, um, it was much harder for me, even though I can say everything I just said and believe in it a hundred percent, but to tell my own story or to share that and have it out there was ridiculously and remains difficult, but not to the paralyzing sense where I would be like, give me 24 hours. Don't post it yet. I want to, I, I'm not sure I might ask you to take it down. And he was like, all right, all right. And now <laughs> you know, coach me off the ledge and all that kind of stuff. But it, it was very hard. Like I said, you can believe in that. But to actually have that out there with you, you're not quite sure who, but what it has brought, I mean, the, the fruits of this have been amazing in ways I never, ever could have expected. I mean, Nick, I'm sure you've had the same thing when people have reached out after certain episodes or things like that. <clears throat> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, but I think a lot, you know, back to that, this question of, um, you know, why you know, content creation. I, I think that fear that Margie was just talking about, fear of being perceived a failure, fear of failing, keeps a lot of people from producing content. Mm -hmm. And understandably so, because like, you know, all you have to do is hop on Twitter for a second to realize how incredibly difficult people can be mm -hmm. um, and how easy it is to say something offensive or, uh, you know, or, you know, just say something you don't even realize that what you're saying is offensive. But I also I think, think goes right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, just a quick, a quick comment. You know, I think one of the things that we need to get good at is being comfortable and being uncomfortable, right? Because our mm -hmm. our students are living in a world of content creation. They're not living in a world that, in my opinion, is largely represented by K twelve curricula that I've seen. You know, I don't I think there's a lot of times where you're like, "Can you just hold on one second? I need to work on this word problem." Like that's not a real life skill exactly, right? Not that doesn't make it unimportant, but I think there are places in the in in what we do, um, K twelve that could be more authentic. Yeah, and I think going to what you were saying about you know um, as a teacher and being a content creator, you know, I think that there is an expectation that you have all the answers. There's this expectation that, you know, you, you don't do anything wrong and there's a fear of criticism. And then there's backlash that you get by parents. Um, and it's just, and sometimes even by colleagues, when you're somebody who's on, you know, the cutting edge of something or who tries something or who risk takes, you know, there's backlash even among colleagues. And um, I remember I always did a play with my, you know, a little, theater production with my students. And I'll never forget in my first district, I had my, the four other teachers that taught fourth grade at the time, there were five of us, came to me as, as a group and literally said to me, you know, like, you need to stop making us look bad. And I was like, what? Because I wouldn't send home the packets before the fourth grade test over winter, you know, the Christmas break just to, for kids. I'm like, like, no, the kids who are already nervous and scared will do it. The kids who don't do work aren't going to do it. Like, I won't do this. Like, I like I'm not sending packets home. And um, and I was at the class play and I'm like, it, I'm not making you look bad. Like you do your own class play or do something that you want to do. Like, I'm not going to stop doing something because you think it makes you look bad. I just remember being so highly offended at that. And I just couldn't honestly believe that four other adults, colleagues would come to me to tell me to stop doing this with my students. So the pressures are real. And um, I think a lot of times people don't, don't realize that. Um, it's great when you're on a great team. There's nothing like it. I've been on amazing teaching teams where we just fueled each other with creativity and excitement and pushing the envelope. And, and it's wonderful. Um, but there, there still is that assumption that you're the teacher, you know, that sage on the stage idea, even though we've done a lot to, to get rid of that and a lot to kind of, you know, learn alongside the kids. Um, for me, technology, I'm not a tech person. I don't think that way. And I remember um, smart boards were brand new. 
and you could put in a proposal to get a smart board. And I did not do that year one. So I watched as my tech colleagues, you know, all teacher friends did this. And I was like, so I put in the proposal to get one for year two. I thought, okay, they'll get the bugs out. <laughs> and I don't want to be so far behind that now I don't know it at all. But I remember when that got installed and half of my students had been in some of these classrooms with smart boards. And so I remember the first day just being like, I don't know how to turn it on. And they're like, oh, here you go. And they're up there. Duh, 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 duh. They're calibrating the screen. They're pressing. And I remember feeling like so insecure and like a failure because I didn't have the answers. Did they think I was a bad teacher? Did they think I was stupid? Are they going to go home and tell their parents, Mrs. Wright couldn't even use a smart board? You know, there was a lot of anxiety. But what I found was just the opposite. The kids were so excited to help, so excited to teach me something. And the more I began to embrace that, I never would have thought that would have been what shifted me <clears throat> to understand what it feels like to learn alongside, to not put that pressure on myself to have all the answers. And that pressure is what kills creativity, kills content creation in my mind, because it becomes your shackle. And uh, But it was because of technology, that smart board that I was just like, you know, I don't know what to do, guys. <laughs> I don't know how to make it work. <laughs> You know, yeah. as you were talking, I, I, it, something kind of jumped into my head a little bit and, you know, I was at one of the schools and they had just gotten back from a um, summer break trip with students and, you know, they were talking about it and talking about, you know, this kid did that, this, you know, they were at a, you know, a whole different place, a new place for these kids. And I thought, you know, again, there was tons of pictures taken but that was the perfect opportunity to make educational content. You know, you're, you're in the, you know, wherever, let's just say Mexico, like, you know, let's, let's make content creation around Mexico. Let's, let's let the kids right there while they're in Mexico. And I don't know that that happened. I mean, I, I'm assuming that it didn't because the conversations were nothing about that, but yeah. um, I'm thinking we have a golden age now where kids could, come back and they could have reams of of footage of great things that they learned and it's on their cell phones they can you know shoot it to google drive and they're off to you know displaying it so i think that's the opportunity that we missed during covid personally like mm -hmm. that was the opportunity to do things differently and it just for so many reasons you know um didn't happen and I it just makes me sad I feel like we've gone backward instead of forward and hopefully we'll get through this mucky place yeah well like I said I think we're poised to take mm -hmm. that next step yeah I would agree so well let's uh again we could kind of dig really deep into that and we talked actually a, a, quite a bit about that in in the toasted uh, mm, talk good. So let's talk about a couple of big questions here. So what are your thoughts about educational technology today? And we already kind of hit on one possibility, but are there some other trends besides content creation that you're kind of looking at on the horizon? Chat GPT, of course, has become, you know, explosion, at least in tech blogs and tech social media. Is it a conversation that's happening in schools where you are? Um, or, I mean, again, are there other trends out there that you're paying attention to? So that would be my biggest deficit area that I admit. Um, I So when I was at TIFF Talks on Wednesday, which uh, Andy, that was amazing, amazing event that you put together and that you orchestrated. It's Great incredible. presentations, yeah. It was amazing. And sitting there and listening to the first three speakers and all the educational technology. And I just, I literally was stunned. I was absolutely speechless. And I feel like in my role with curriculum, I should have that knowledge and know how and be on the cutting edge of all that. And I am, what I took away was I, I knew there was stuff I didn't know, but now I saw in my face what it is that I don't know and that we don't have or don't use, or perhaps only in pockets or little bits. And um, for our, my district that I'm in right now, um, last year was the first year it was a one-to-one -one device so we are still very new as far as as a school whole being with educational technology now there are absolutely teachers that are incredible with it and use it and certainly students but as a whole we are not there um i don't believe i think we are absolutely poised to be there um but 
I'm not versed enough to know how to introduce and bring this, you know, um, to the district in, in a in a way that, like I saw um, at the tip talks, that was, you know, amazing. Some of those programs and the things that, you know, I mean, I've been out of the classroom now for nine years. And so even then it was just the beginning of things like Quizlet and Nearpod and, you know, just, it was still very, you know, basic compared to what it is just, you know, not quite a decade later. So I, uh, I think it's great. I think it's amazing. I, I think that they're, you know, the difficulty in my opinion with public education K-12 is the is the ability to see professional development as worthwhile for teachers to see it, for taxpayers to see it, for everyone and to agree on what that means and to find things that are a lift for everyone. And that's really hard, you know, when you're talking about every single staff member, you know, so the way we do it with a single conference day, you can't meet everyone's needs that way. And so just to look at how it's done and do it differently so we can truly meet needs. Um, I don't have the answers to it. I just think that we, we need to rethink how we do it so people have the chance, not just learn it but use it and play with it and be able to develop it and then create content and to feel comfortable doing so and for me we we actually do talk a lot about chat gpt in fact it's one of my current obsessions and so it's probably me more than anything that um my my colleague sarah dr sarah how to bring bruno and i are presenting We've done a couple presentations on it already, but we're presenting in Scranton uh, soon, May twenty third. Oh, yeah, right. She <laughs> she's actually from that area and has oh, promised yeah. has promised to take me to a bar that has the actual "Welcome to Scranton" sign. Apparently, they had to take it down to protect it. So, oh, of course. oh my gosh! Oh my yeah. gosh! <laughs> so, um, I'm kind of excited, and. Uh, I think here's what scares me right now. Uh, educational technology has always been that thing that uh, early adopters are super excited about. And then you have kind of everybody else following. What worries me right now is that we have had kind of a couple of phases of um, – transformational technology. I think, you know, we would say the internet being one and then iPhones, we kind of missed the boat on the iPhones. In my opinion, that was a, a mobile pervasive technology that schools didn't have to pay for that we could have harnessed in a way that I don't think we ever really did. Then we went one-to-one. -one, so, you know, we still have pervasive technology, but now I'm sort of wondering like, what do we do in a world with AI? Right. And so some of the things that we've done in the past are simply not worth doing. And I think we have to kind of come to terms with that and, mm -hmm. um, and accept our role as educators. And I think, you know, a doctor can't not pay attention to the latest research in medicine. Doesn't mean they have to agree with it, but they have to, they have to stay up to date, right? It's malpractice mm -hmm. if they don't. And where I'm at right now is kind of feeling like if we don't stay up to date on AI, we are committing educational malpractice. And that's just my opinion. You know, I, I just think, I just think where it's going and what it's doing and what it will do when it's pervasive. Um, Cause let's face it, you know, it's only a matter of time before, you know, it is, and it's portable. Um, I think, you know, I think we've got, got a lot of really strong considerations to make uh, around AI and education. And I think we really need to start that conversation. And I don't think chat GPT, by the way, just to be clear, I think it's the first wave of a much more robust situation, you know, because um, I mean, chat GPT is interesting and it's fun. And, you know, frankly, I make it part of my curriculum and I make my students use it. but it's limited in what it can do. Um, but the next versions won't be in, in ways that we can't even imagine yet. So I, I guess that's the main thing for me is AI right now is like, I'm really hoping for that. The other one I think that is interesting and, and um, our talk on the toasted podcast is really cool with the virtual worlds, because I think 
I think that, particularly for low income uh, areas, has a lot of potential to revolutionize education. So I really like that too. I talk too much. No, no, it's all really good stuff. Um, you know, I, I had kind of a, a moment of clarity, I think, recently with VR in particular, which I didn't think was all that impressive when I first, when VR first started coming out, because I thought that's really kind of just, uh, you're consuming, right? It's just, you're seeing things. You're not right. having that ability to interact. But I've had kind of an eye-opening experience. Um, I got a, a VR a Quest headset couple years ago for Christmas and wasn't really using it much until I got this exercise app, which is like, um, you know, boxing type app and it's the greatest workout ever. I'll be honest. Really? It's, wow. it, I, it, it is fun. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm a person who knows the importance of working out, but, um, you know, it's, it's boring, right? It's, oh yeah. gosh. You Super know, boring. I, Treadmills I, are yeah. oh, the worst. I, exactly. <laughs> and I don't like running and, you know, <clears throat> Um, but the VR workout is amazing. It's, it really is a high tech workout and you can choose a different workout each time. Wow. And, uh, so I think that's an area that we haven't even thought about like yeah. phys ed and, and VR, yeah. um, that's out there. So if you get that VR headset, you know, go the exercise route. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. That's, you mentioned something else there, just thinking about educational trends and Gosh, what if it was just all fun? I mean, not all, right? you know, but but what happened? Like, why? How we ever got to this place where we felt like we, it couldn't be fun is so interesting to me. You know, mm -hmm. the kids can't possibly be learning if they're having fun. Someone actually said that to me once, not too long ago. Oh, that's even more sad. Yeah, and I think <laughs> I think there's there's a culture of people who really believe that, and that's. To me, like, gosh, what a terrible way to go to work every day. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, I just think that in learning, you know, before <clears throat> children ever step foot into a school, they are learning. They are just little receptors for learning at the world around them. They're exploring and doing and learning and taking in information and, you know, and how that I get standards, I get standardized education, I get, you know, you want all kids at this level to know this, this, and, and certainly, you know, I'm not saying to throw that out the window. I, I just, I don't quite understand. I'm much more of a competency-based education. I really think it, it, you know, it's not like that, you know, September to June, the grade level, the all of that. I don't know why you just can't pick up where you left off, like that more competency-based, multi-age you know, um, out of the box, natural progression of learning, I just think is something that, that in general, I think people are just afraid of because it's not nice and neat. And because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go in a prescribed way. And I think people get too much in a groove um, of it has to be, you know, in September, we this in October, we this and, da, 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 da. and if a child doesn't progress, and I know something I've always said is like, okay, but if you take a newborn, and you take, you know, a, a 12 month old, they're fundamentally different. And now somehow at five, they're supposed to be leveled off. It's like, that's just not it. They're developmentally so different that those month spans and, and, you know, one month they can't sit up and one month they can, you know, and so to try and put them as five-year-olds or four-year-olds and five about to be six-year-olds in the same, they're developmentally and socially, emotionally so different. So to expect them all to now to sit and do their letters and their sounds and their number, it just it's not natural. It's not realistic, you know, and, and some kids pick it up quicker and some kids have struggles and some kids, you know, so to have more of that competency base, but still, you know, as, as you can still, you're hitting standards. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is helping people understand that, you know, standards are not curriculum. <laughs> standards are standards. Your curriculum helps you to hit those standards and your lesson plans are based on the curriculum to hit the standards. And I think that there's still um, a lot of, misunderstanding with that. And I really think that the whole rollout of Common Core just, just 
killed in APPR, you know, all at the same time, just really killed teacher take teachers being willing to take risks. Um, it, I think that the judgment and all of that just, it made everybody scared and you were just coming off of that and personalized learning was really beginning to start to like give people that creative freedom back. And, you know, all of these things, classrooms were looking different and then COVID hit and then we were back to rows and six feet apart and what do we do? And, and so I just feel like, oh, you know, it just, it, it just feels like that riptide you know, drags you under. I can think of, uh, when you said that I had this instant, like, uh, might've been a gag reflex, but I was, <laughs> you know, I was, I had this memory of Don't a teacher. Hold back, coming, Nick. <laughs> I had this teacher who came to me and I was a principal at the time. She said, oh, I told you we should never have gotten rid of the desks. And I was like, give me a freaking break. Like yeah. this is a pandemic. Like nobody, pan nobody planned on this. And by the way, that was, that was not educational best practice, right? Like right. we were just trying to get through it. Right. I don't know. Yep. No, I, I had a few of those as well. We're so, so we're so quick to say like, oh, we should we should go back to Rose and blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> like that oh, was yeah. we're know. there. Yeah. Well, you said the APPR and Common Core, and I often say I wanted to actually develop a workshop called Death by Acronym, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think in in education we have way too many acronyms <laughs> and nobody knows what half of them are anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so all right. Well, we, uh, if I ask the next question, I think we'll be here for another hour. So I'm going to go into the, the speed geek questions so okay. we can head into our weekend. We've got a little bit of a sun out there, but so I'm just going to randomly spin the dial here and I'm going to start with uh, what's your favorite social network, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, probably I'd say probably Instagram. I love it too. <laughs> it's my yeah. guilty pleasure. It's quick bites. It's interesting things. Easy and to I follow. Don't, you know, yeah. Not much on education either. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes you feel better. It gives you a laugh most of the time. Yes, definitely. Uh, I agree. How about you, Nick? I'm probably Twitter. Although I'm kind of into LinkedIn too, for weird reasons I can't exactly explain. I, <laughs> I think I've always been a little bit of an outlier in terms of like most things, but I think... I don't know. I, Twitter was like what, when I was um, sort of cutting my teeth in education, everyone was on Twitter and that was like, there was a lot of great stuff mm -hmm. on there. And um, I'm not sure it evolved in the same way that other things did. I just never really got on. Like I still don't have a Facebook account. Uh, I don't have an Instagram account. Sort of I do, but it's through my business and right. I actually paid my sister to run it if we're being honest. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> you know, yeah, I guess that's my answer. All right, those are good ones. So let's go, uh, this is the toughest one I usually ask, but I think it's to me one of the most interesting is what's your favorite educational blog? Uh, I am I feel like I'm so out of touch with a lot of things. I The one I tend to always go back to is Cult of Pedagogy. Um, that's probably one of my favorites. And I like to then go on the rabbit trail of the different people and yeah. links and recommendations. So that's definitely, I think, just so, so, so solid. That's my favorite. That's funny. You totally stole mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I really I really do like that one. Um, and, and through that, I found some other really good ones. But if I had to pick one, that's probably where I would land. Yeah, I think we probably have a three-star agreement on there. I actually yeah. had a chance yeah. to uh, interview Jennifer Gonzalez for oh, this really? podcast. Yeah, and it was a great conversation. Like with the three of us here, we could have we can talk for hours. She can talk for hours. I was really happy. So reach out to her. I'm sure she'd probably jump on with you guys sometime because she's yeah. you know that kind of person. She's you know a sharer. Thank you. So, all right, let's go with uh, something a little more fun. What's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Let's break away. Um, I love, I mean, I almost always have music on in the background, you know, like at home. I, I will have I will have the Pandora playing more so than a television or, you know, relax like that. Um, I love to be um, outside, but like sitting on my balcony, like taking in, you know, like that or going for a hike or a walk or something along that line, um, not, you know. Some kind of major rigorous thing so those are definitely you know just the quiet sometimes just just that the quietness journaling i love to journal um so you know just that time to not have voices at you and and everything so that those are my favorite ways to unplug if you will 
Nick? Um, this time of year, it's probably gardening. I'm, I'm getting my garden going. Um, I like to be outside, but hiking. Vegetable garden or flower garden or both? Uh, mostly vegetables. I pretty much do everything I do is motivated by food. So if I'm going to plant something, I want to be able to eat it. I, I don't hate flowers. I just don't understand why people <laughs> spend a lot of time planting them. <laughs> I like it. All right. Well, uh, thank you both for spending some time with me today and we'll appreciate you. the great, great ideas and let's keep in touch and uh, bring you back to answer that last question of starting your own school from scratch. And Oh, I that'd be a great conversation. Get, oh, yeah. yeah, that's an hour. That's definitely that's an hour. hour. And then I'll give Margie that. a turn to talk. After that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Andy, great. thank you for having us here. And thank you so much for being on Toasted Podcast with us. It was, it's been fantastic. All yeah, right. That's great. Thank we'll you. We'll tag each other and connect. Definitely. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.